In fact, with a nice cozy audience like this, we can add even see if there's special interests or people actually, you know, is it in general that you're interested in? The, the actual subject is low latency Java in the real world with actual experiences of the Zing JVM. It's a product we make at LMAX, at the LMAX Exchange. Um, and we've been doing stuff there for a couple of years now. Uh, how many of you actually deal with low latency systems? Okay. How about doing that in Java? Well, I know what you do. Yeah. Good. Okay. So it's in that world. The others, are you interested in low latency in Java? Hopefully you're here. Good. <laughs> okay. So that, that's what I'm going to cover. And, and um, I actually put this presentation together with LMAX. Um, and uh, I'm really, really happy that we have this material because it's really rare for us to have a financial services customer that is willing to openly talk about their experiences with our products. Usually our customers won't talk. Um, Azul is installed in seven out of the top 10 financial uh, uh, investment banks, for example, in the world, running various systems, but none of them will let us say who they are. Notice I didn't say 10 out of the top 10, so I can still say that, right? Um, but LMAX Exchange actually is fairly open, and they'll talk, and they'll describe what they actually do, and you've seen the results with open source as well. So um, it's about low latency Java, in the real world. So low latency, we know, hopefully know that, you know, this is like things that take low tens of microseconds to maybe milliseconds. And Java, we hopefully know what that is. And the real world is important. This is not theory. This is actual experience over two years of actual deployment. So we can talk about what happened. And I'll cover some of the, some of the lessons learned as well. What would we do differently had we started today, for example? Um, you know, I'll talk about me, and then I'll show you who I stand in for. Um, I'm the CTO at Azul, so it's all my fault. I've been working on all kinds of things, including garbage collection for a decade plus around JVMs, and this is some evidence of me doing garbage collection in my kitchen. It's a broken trash compactor, fragments are falling off the back, the compaction function wasn't working right, so I had to fix it and debug it, and I thought it'd be cool to take a picture with a book. Um, this is in 2004, so it's stale, and I really need a new picture. Um, I have a long history of building all kinds of things, physical machines, virtual machines, kernels, a lot of systems programming, applications distributed across many systems for millions of subscribers, and firewalls and switches, and lots of stuff. I'm, I'm a little older than I look, or maybe it started uh, you know, catching up with me. Um, but I, I've been working with computers since about 1982, so I have a long memory now. Um, I also have a pet hobby of scaring people about latency, not about the length of it, but about what they know or don't know about it and the irresponsible things they do when they measure it. If you're interested in a topic, you know, look up how not to measure latency or things of that sort, and there's some useful things around that. So that's me. Now, I'm also standing in for Mark Price, who is an LMAX engineer, and we actually build this presentation together, but he's in London right now. So instead of him, there's me. Um, this, this is a scary picture that I took when taking a really, really scary ride, and you can see my reaction to it. This is the Dumbo ride in Disneyland. Uh, it really is. You know? <laughs> it's taken from another Dumbo, and we were making a face. I like the picture. Uh, anyway, um, Mark is a senior developer at LMAX. He is focused on performance, not just in his job, but in general. He just likes performance things. Um, he's, um, he's touched pretty much everything at LMAX because he's been there for, I think, about eight years. And, and right now, he's, he's uh, focusing on performance and monitoring, but he's touched not just performance things. He's actually built a lot of parts. Um, one of my favorite things about how he describes his job uh, is he used to be this guy. Uh, the guy who everybody came to, like the psychiatrist here, with their GC logs, and they told him their troubles, and he had to console them and try and help them through the problems and you know, teach them how to do better with their life and you know, live within the environment they have to live with and such. Um, so GC tuning and garbage collection knowledge was one of his central purviews, and you know, he was the go-to guy around that. Um, 
LMAX in general. Uh, and again, I'm not LMAX, but oh, I forgot to do a really important thing here. Right here, see when I do this, we're gonna do this experiment. When I'm Mark, I'll do that. <laughs> and when I'm Gil, I won't have that on. We'll see how that works, okay? So here's me uh, going through our cool discussion. And at LMAX, and I'm not speaking for LMAX, but this is their material. Um, LMAX is basically a venue for low latency uh, trading. They are the first regulated MTF, that's a multilateral trading facility, I believe, uh, for transparent um, order-driven FX trading. I'm sorry I'm reading the points because it's not mine and I need to be careful not to say wrong things. Um, they have all kinds of accolades and awards. For example, they, were, they won the first uh, place in the uh, uh, Tech Track 100, and uh, in general, they aim to be uh, the f world's fastest FX trading exchange. So they compare themselves to other, they actually put up things on their website to talk about their latency behavior over the last 30 days, things like that. They're amazingly transparent for what the industry usually is, which, which I like a lot, because it all, not, not only do we like them as a customer and that, but we get to see their improvement and their, the fact that we can share that with the world is great. Um, now, the openness of them is also relatively rare. Not only are we here talking about what they do with their material, um, they're also, they've embraced open source quite a bit. Um, and you probably know them from the for LMX Disruptor, which is a common uh, pattern used in low latency or high throughput systems today. Uh, that came out of LMX. Okay, so we'll do how that. Um, Zing. Yeah. We talked a little about LMAX. What is Zing? Zing is a JVM for Linux x86. It's basically good for not just being fast, but being fast all the time. We actually think that the decision, probably about 20 years ago, to build this runtime that's so popular now, but allow it to go out to lunch anytime it wants to, was just a fundamental mistake. Computers didn't behave like that before. It wasn't acceptable. And the fact that we've evolved into something that is so ingrained and fundamental and productive and good, but goes and stops anytime it wants to and doesn't run continuously is just wrong. Uh, so we rolled the clock back on that and said, JVMs are not supposed to stop. It's okay for your application to do whatever bugs you have, but the JVM needs to keep running and keep running you and it shouldn't be stopping you, at least not for noticeable amounts of time. Uh, so we start off by basically eliminating garbage collection as a concern. We don't eliminate garbage collection, we just do it right. I mean, we do it without stopping the application or stopping the application for any perceivable amount of time from the application's point of view. Uh, from an enterprise environment, that's a complete elimination. And we're not just talking about the big bad GCs, we're talking about any of the GC effects. Small, bad, new gen, old gen, they're all gone. And whether it's low latency or human scale response time, the effect is very noticeable. In low latency systems, people think that multi-millisecond pauses are deadly. Humans would love it if that's all they had, right? Uh, and in human applications, when you're you know, doing interactive analytics with a 50 gigabyte data cube, and it works pretty well most of the time, but then when it wants to do something, you need to go get a cup of coffee and come back, right? And then there's the annoying you know, online retail level of people just don't like waiting more than a fraction of a second to see the next shirt or dress or something or TV. Um, so it, across all that small, large memory, high throughput, low throughput, GC no longer bothers you. You no longer think about it. And you know, it's a solved problem. And I've, you know, I talk about it a lot, but we really should just stop talking about it. It's done. Let's move on to actual engineering. We don't need to reinvent that wheel over and over and over again anymore. Uh, and I think other people will solve this too. It's just Zing right now is the only one that does. Now, the key quality of this is that idiomatic Java code actually works. You don't need to start writing non-idiomatic things just to work around things that are broken in your system. The system works smoothly even when you write regular Java code the way you would naturally gravitate to using it. And that means that, you know, even if you can't afford any kind of blips that are noticeable, things still work well. Now, <laughs> at LMAX, it's very important to stay responsive 
And a good example of that is a recent event that happened in the market. You might have heard about the change in the uh, Swiss franc pricing and how it decoupled from other things. And that change came as an event, a surprising event to some people in the market, causing some interesting spikes in volume that went right along with it. Um, so even when the traffic pattern changes, and even if when it changes as a surprise, you still need to stay responsive. In fact, this is the most critical time to stay responsive. If you look through news elements uh, right after this, the, play, the trading systems and exchanges that made it through unscathed made, put out press releases on the fact that they did, because that's something to be proud of. The guys who didn't put out press releases, well, you know, you can think of what happened there. They probably just didn't draw attention to what happened. Um, Elmex made it completely unscathed with this. They should be very proud. We should be very proud of our participation in part, a small part of doing that. Um, now, when you look at the traffic, the real world traffic that changes all the time, this is a very interesting data point we got. Um, and, and, and this is actually looking at what a second behaves like averaged across a day. So this is every millisecond of the second, left to zero, there is a thousand, but repeated over a day. So this is the average of when things happen during a second. What you see here is an interesting set of patterns. There are four spikes every second. And something happens four times a second that changes information and people react to it by trading. And they don't wait half a second, they don't smear it, it doesn't happen randomly over time. They concentrate very hard. If you just measured rates per second, you get this red line over there. But if you were only able to handle the red line or two or three or five times that, you wouldn't come close to being able to handle this without blips. In fact, this is the average across an entire day. You can imagine that the bad seconds in the day have spikes that are an order of magnitude bigger than this. Now, the message here is, when you design the system to handle load, it needs to handle the worst load you actually need to handle, which is the top of this peak times 10, or whatever it is in the bad seconds. And that number is nowhere close to an average. Working on the average means dying most of the time. It's not a good business proposition. So you need to stay responsive at the top of the top of the peaks. And Statistics don't help you know, when bad things happen and the phone rings with upset customers, right? Looking at the architecture and the, some of the key pieces of the execution venue at, at LMAX, these are block diagrams of, of pretty much you know, gateways talking to external things, market makers on one side and brokers and customers on the other. Um, you have flows going into matching engines and the secondary for redundancy and some journaling and so predate risk and credit things that happen. Um, in, in English English, um, a, this is called a packet of chips. So this is funny in England. Um, we'll take a packet and move it through the system, right? Uh, we did the presentation in, in, in England first. And basically, you'll have packets going in, coming in from market makers in this case, going through a disruptor. Each one of these circles is a disruptor. Um, going through the gateways, doing whatever protocol conversions and such that happen there, uh, going into the actual execution matching engine, uh, performing the actual matching, but since you need to get good records of this, this goes both into a journal, into a secondary in case failure is there, uh, joins back in when we know that both of them are actually taken, doing whatever output formatting and processing and other things need to happen, sent back through the uh, gateway for whatever conversion and sending there, and then go back out to the market makers. That is the typical classic path of latency through the system, from taking the message to getting the message back out. That's the latency that we're really interested in. And as you see, it goes through multiple hops through multiple systems. In the case of non-market makers, there is additional hops going through, and that's because there's additional steps that need to happen as well. Um, now, that's the picture and system at LMAX, looking at, from an Azul perspective and a Zig perspective, the general world of Java and low latency, first question we often ask is, really? I mean, why are people using Java and low latency? Don't you know what's going to happen, right? Remember, this is a platform that wasn't designed to pause, but in practice just pauses a lot. And that should, would seem like a contradiction. And the interesting thing is, 
the answer comes back as, yes, we know that and we still use it. And there are reasons for that. For example, time to stability of the platform. From the day we need to do something until we have it stable in people's hands, running in production, Java is provably better than others, empirically better than others, across many, many organizations. And that's not limited to enterprise web-facing applications. It includes low latency systems. They're good, proven things when people actually do this, where they just get there quicker. Um, time to market goes right along with that. So not only do you get a good, stable product, you can basically ship earlier. Not just stability, but actual completeness is there quicker. And one of the very important ones, and people underestimate this, is time to performance. So people might think Java might be fast, might be slow, and we think it's pretty fast. Can you do faster? Probably. But what can you do in the next three months? And if you start today, who's going to have a faster system in the market three months from now? It's almost invariably that Java beats other environments. Well, when I mean other environments, I mean non-runtime based environments, for example, C, C++, in doing that. Eventually, you might be faster otherwise. But if you need to get there quickly, for example, if you have an algo or something, you know, or you actually want to be in the market quickly, the amount of effort and the time to get there is shorter. These are all things that we hear from multiple customers, not just LMAX, in the actual Java world as the reason that they actually code in Java for low latency. This is the why. Now, that why is there even without Zing, before we came along and changed the picture a little. Um, now, overall productivity and delivery and everything just trump the downsides. There are downsides. People are aware of them. But the benefit outweighs the bad. So when we look at this, things like LMAX, every single step we just showed you is pure Java. There isn't any native code in any of these systems. And this is the way it was designed from the start. It was delivered, and it's a poster child. It is the fastest FX trading venue out there, better than whatever else there is. And it's written all in Java. And this was true before Zing was started there. This is purely a Java benefit. Now, Java has good, as I said, but it also comes with some bad and some uglies, right? So the good is, you know, fast. It's productive. You can get really good code out of it. And, you know, if you saw Charlie's talk, which I didn't, but I've seen versions of it, the, the compilers and optimized to do an amazing job at getting good machine code out. Yes, you could do a little bit better in various ways, but you get damn close to, to, to there. Um, so the way I think about it is, if you have good developers, they will get good stuff out of anything. They'll get stuff out of machine code, out of C, out of C++, out of Java. And most of the good developers actually know most multiple languages. And they'll choose whatever is the right tool for their job. Usually, it'll be whatever gets them there quicker, or whatever makes it easier or more stable, whatever they're aiming for. So when people I see in low latency choose Java, that's not because that's all they know. Most of the people I know in low latency Java are actually really good C and C++ programmers that choose to use Java, which tells you something. The same is true in reverse. Bad developers are going to give you bad, slow code no matter what they write in. You can't help that. And that means you need to get good developers if you want good code, especially if performance is a hypercritical kind of thing. Now, the simple truth is there are more Java developers than C and C++ developers out there. The hiring pool is larger by an order of magnitude or more. That's not to say that the Java guys are smarter or less smart. They're just more of them. So if you're out there hiring for developers to deliver something, it is easier to find people to do this. It's easier to find them and or train them to get there. Those are all the good things. However, JVMs are not continually fast. They just weren't built that way from the start. And, and we don't think of this as a design criteria of Java. It's just an accidental artifact of history. People didn't think it would be used in places that are so sensitive, so they didn't design that into how the runtimes work. And when you actually look at it, the key things are GC, but there's a lot more than GC out there. There's lions and tigers and bears. And the lion is the GC. There are other things JVM does, JVMs do that stall that even if you solve GC, they will come back and bite you. At Azul, we actually look at all of them. We don't think that solving GC is we're done. The goal is to not blip and pause, whatever that is, whatever causes that, right? 
Um, now, low latency Java, and I use quotes to describe that, is usually Java but written differently. You use the Java syntax, you write in Java, but you avoid using idiomatic Java because it's the idiomatic Java things that then make the environment eventually do the blips and pauses and bad things. So in some cases, it means don't load and unload classes a lot. That, that's, I think that's fairly reasonable. But in some cases, it means don't allocate objects. Or just don't allocate a lot of them. Try to allocate so slowly that there won't be a GC, an, a full GC or an old gen GC today, and maybe just a new gen very rarely. It's a very common practice. Now, how do you do that? By not being idiomatic. You, can't, you can either do nothing, and then it's easy, but if you actually do work and you're doing idiomatic Java, you will be generating lots of temporary objects. That's just a side effect of idiomatic Java work. Uh, if you want to do it differently, you're going to code differently. And the first step in coding differently is not using anybody else's code. Because everybody else's code was written in idiomatic Java. So it doesn't just matter what you do. There's this nice protocol engine over there that can parse things for you. And you don't have to write it. But unfortunately, it allocates objects. So you can't use that. And there's nice journaling system. There's nice messaging system. And all the things that other people have built in Java are not directly usable if you are trying to do very low allocation Java, which means you write everything yourself and you lose a lot of leverage. But this does work, and that's what people tend to do. So with that, you know, let's look at what Zing does to low latency Java. Um, Zing is basically a JVM that values consistency. We put a high value or a high price on being inconsistent. And GC noise in Zing and other noise too has been reduced to the level where it's below the operating system noise. We are not at zero. We actually do pause four times for each GC cycle. But the pauses are so short, they're not perceptible for most systems, even when the system is well tuned. The natural noise the operating system has is higher and more frequent than the noise we generate. At this point, we can improve it better. We can do better, but it's becoming hard to measure. Because we are not the signal. We are just the noise on top of the signal at that point, and the correlation is very low. Um, now, that means we keep all the good, and we get rid of the bad and the ugly parts. So you get all the productivity. You get all the leverage. You get to use other people's code. And you get to write an idiomatic Java, and you don't have to think of those GC saving. Let's not pressure the GC. Let's not hurt it. Let's not scare it, because we're sensitive to latency. If the GC just works right, the way it was supposed to work from the start, regular idiomatic work shouldn't hurt. And with Zing, it doesn't. So basically, you could just take away all the weird things people do to get around or avoid stuff. I often have debates with people that say, you want high performance, you've got to allocate less. That's bullshit. And, and some of those people are, will debate it hard with me. right? I have a simple proof for that. On a regular hotspot JVM, not Zing, I can have 20 gigabytes per second of allocation done in a couple of threads sustained with noise that's no bigger than 5 milliseconds. That's big for us, but you know, if there's absolutely nothing in the heap, if all you do is generate junk, you can allocate that fast. Allocation is not a hard thing, and garbage collection behind allocation is nearly free. It gets more and more expensive in blips, time to blip, if you actually have objects. And the pauses get better, but the efficiency is there. Allocation doesn't slow things down. I know people think that, but we have proof that it doesn't. It slows things down by creating unacceptable blips, which make you say, I can't go there and let's design differently. Not because you're inefficient, not because you're spending 30% of your time on something or it takes longer to do stuff. In fact, allocation is often the fastest thing you could do in Java or in any language. It's faster than object pooling, for example. Mathematically, you can't do an object pool that's as fast as, a, as an on-heap allocator. Um, so. At the LMAX exchange, what do we do with Zing? Um, so Zing started deployment about two years ago at LMAX. We, we, we did the dance and, and other things together. But about two years ago is when we actually started deploying. And we went through an interesting and long road in deploying it with some lessons learned. We started off from incremental deployments from the most critical systems to the least critical systems across the board. 
and where things are now is, you know, we went from across latency sensitive systems and then filled up throughput sensitive systems that are not even latency sensitive. So the expansion is now fairly wide. I wouldn't say everything is running on Zing, but most critical services end up being on Zing as a default. Now, the latency critical path is obvious why you would apply it. If you care about the jitter and the spikes and the stalls and the hiccups and the noise in the latency path, Zing is simply an easy way to address those in addition to whatever other engineering you might do on it or as a, as a replacement for it. But the throughput critical path gets very interesting. Now, the throughput critical path, it's about speed and you need to keep going fast, so why would a blip matter if it's not on the latency critical path? What happens is if a stall is big enough on the throughput side, for example, in historic uh, uh, market data capturing or in gateways that transmit things to people that are not that sensitive to the latency but can't lose stuff, um, then you get back pressure. And the back pressure says, oh, wait a minute, I am behind by a lot. I need you to stop and stall, and you do NAX into the critical system, and you see outliers that come from multi-second or half-second level things, not milliseconds, and the throughput path starting to blip the latency path. So unless you have truly decoupled unbounded queues or the, the, the acceptance of loss in the throughput critical side, you end up affecting the latency critical side too, so that's why solving blips that are higher magnitude down there becomes important. It, Um, some of them are streaming, for example, market data capture and journaling and stuff like that. Some of them are just, um, um, think of it as, as uh, well, I guess it'd be streaming too. It's just uh, broadcast systems of some sort, right? Uh, you know, I got it, forward it, get it to other people, reformat it, whatever it is, but yeah. Um, so that's an interesting thing we learned because we didn't think we'd be going after the throughput critical at the beginning, and it turned out, hey, there was some good value there too. Um, now, if we look at the systems on the latency path, um, we started off with the center, the heart, the most important part, and worked to address that and, and deploy there. And from there, we expanded to additional pieces on the latency critical path in that order. And now we cover all those with Zing. And then we expanded to these other latency, non-latency, but throughput sensitive adjunct systems that could back pressure this or in general need to be happy. Um, so that's, that's the order of, of, of deployment. I will discuss some of the lessons learned about that in, in a little while. Um, now, if you look at development practices at LMAX, I think there's a lot to learn from uh, there uh, in general, but also how it helped us here. Um, there's a heavy focus on, on test-driven development and continuous integration at LMAX. Um, it, there, the acceptance tests that they have are very wide and robust. They have a good discipline around not doing just ad hoc testing and not retaining them for regression and such. Uh, and then they have test systems for test generation. Uh, performance is tested like correctness is. And that's a very, very important thing to understand. And it was extremely valuable in going through this process because a performance regression is considered a failure which a lot of systems fail to do. They'll, they'll have a side thing that gives them performance, but they don't treat it the same way. And they treat it extremely, uh, in extreme ways in the sense of, like, that is a breakage. You just don't go any forward from that. You don't kind of keep going and hope to fix it later. Um, and, and that's a very, very healthy way to look at it. First, you need to have the test, and then you need to actually treat them seriously. Um, confidence. You get confidence out of that to create large changes because you have the coverage. You actually have a feel for what it'll be like when you deploy it, rather than you got this nice functional thing that seems to work well. But you know we don't quite know what the performance will be like because we don't have a good robust set of tests for performance. The fact that there's a good set of tests for it and a good modeling system for you know packet arrivals and stuff like that allows you to say, what if we deployed this and get relatively high confidence in doing this? The real world is always the real world, but you know, Zing and LMAX produces some benefits we, we'd like to see. First of all, we see improved latency behaviors. And that, that's that's obviously one of the key features we would look for, right? Actually measurable improved latency behaviors. But interestingly, um, probably the most important or the more important value over time is not the improvement in latency, 
Because in reality, give good engineers a task of improving latency, they will find a way to do it. It's the reduction in the engineering effort in general and the engineering effort aimed at reducing and keeping latency healthy that is the real benefit. It's not that Zing is the only way to get this. You can rewrite the whole thing in not Java and maybe get better latency consistency. That would just take a lot of work and hurt your productivity and time to market, but it's doable. The actual measurable things are how much effort do you spend on these problems and how much time do you save from that. I wouldn't say that we have specific numbers from that, or at least not ones that you could share. Am I running? No, I don't think I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm running behind. I think that was just early. Good. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully. Because I'm looking at the clock and saying, wow, 35 minutes in, they already clap. Wow. You can clap for me if you want. But <laughs> Yay. Okay. Yeah. But we will continue. Good. Um, okay. So, look, not only do you get better latency behavior, but you no longer battle the stuff. And no battling means you don't have to think about it, performance tune it, go through three weeks of the new thing is there and it regressed and we're fixing it every time. So it's not just the numbers, it's the time to get those numbers and the effort and the cost to get those numbers. Idiomatic Java and being able to use it or use it again or not stop using it is a big deal. And this, all of those have happened here. So there are places where there are new functionality needed and oh, you can use idiomatic Java in other people's code to do it. There are places where um, you're able to keep using it because the alternative to getting what you want was to re-engineer away from it. And there are places where it was engineered away. And now you could go back to using it. All of these have happened within the systems, right? At various degrees. Um, so you can avoid doing special practices. You can avoid easing up an allocation styles. You can avoid, you know, not using other people's code. So you can go back to good productive things and that gives more leverage. It makes the Java choice even more right than it was before Zing. Java was right to begin with, but I think we, we, we kind of tipped the scales much more. Um, now let's look at some um, specific things. Um, or in addition to those, what did I just flip through? Yeah. Um, Let's talk about actual numbers. So I, I asked, yeah, OK, you're right, exactly. Um, I asked for actual numbers. These are the numbers that LMAX was willing to share. And here are some interesting things. So Zing helped tame new gen GCs, which is most of what they dealt with, because remember, this is highly tuned code, um, across, uh, across the spectrum. And for example, in a previously highly engineered system, this is systems that, you know, the center of the center, the thing all the engineers were, were looking at, the thing was already highly tuned. The improvement was from four millisecond blips, which is amazingly good, every 30, uh, every 30 seconds to a one millisecond blip every two hours. So we took a really good system and made it, made it a lot better. So, okay, the magnitude is much smaller for the blip, right? One quarter. But the frequency is dramatically slower. This is hundreds of times less frequent for outliers. So multiple orders of magnitude of betterness from a latency outlier and glitch and people being angry at the performance point of view. Now, in a less well-tuned system, this is still low latency, but just not that much attention like a formula. So it can get, hey, these guys are excellent, right? Somebody who could get an actual Java system running in production to not blip for more than four milliseconds without Zing, hats off to them. Right? <laughs> um, but in, in the normal ones, blips that were 50 milliseconds roughly every 30 seconds went down to three every 15. So an order of magnitude reduction in magnitude in the size and an order of magnitude reduction in frequency at the same time. These are actual impacts on actual systems measured from before Zing deployment to after over time, right? So where are we today kind of thing? And these did not involve engineering to work around GC, quite the opposite, right? Now that was new gen. All gen also happens. Not in the latency critical path so much, except when you have, you know, surprising bandwidth and surprising volumes. Because if you actually look at how low latency systems avoid doing all gen anything, they just have a big enough all gen so the promotion throughout the day or the week in an FX system doesn't fill it up, so it never needs to collect. That works great until you have a higher volume event. 
where this week has five times the volume of a regular week and maybe you do have to collect it, right? In the less uh, latency uh, critical systems, this happens even more because people just haven't spent the engineering to avoid allocating enough and promoting enough. They just have real world things there. And in those cases, the CMS, this is a concurrent mark sweep collector that most people in a latency or response time sensitive environment in Java would use on Hotspot today. Generally, they've had, you know, half second level blips intraday, and those are completely gone. Um, that means, you know, there's no more back pressure on the, on the, from the throughput critical system into the uh, uh, latency critical systems, and that helped. Now, pre Azul, these would occur less predictably, but multiple times, right? They would happen all over the t place, and you'd have to hunt them down and be quiet. Kind of depends on traffic patterns and behaviors, I guess. Now, after they deployed Zing, this only happens if somebody forgets to turn Zing on or to use Zing. Because, hey, they're still using stuff every once in a while for other things. OK, so let's look at some lessons learned from this. And I would say um, I could wear the hat or not. These are lessons learned together. Um, now, first of all, what would we do a little different? In this deployment, and it's a natural thing to do, we went after the problem by attacking the critical problem first. This is the, the hardest thing to do in a system, right? We went after the heart of the exchange, the execution venue. This is the thing that was only pausing for four milliseconds. It was extremely well engineered. This is where people had focused all their effort and engineering effort, and we went to go and make that better. Now, obviously, it's the heart and it's the highest value point, but it's also the one that's had the most effort put into it. It's also the one that's the riskiest, the most conservative from a decision point of view, right? If you go and do that, you know, you need to beat the engineering effort and you'll have smaller gains and you'll have to gain confidence on the bet the business part of the thing, right? That's what we did. And we did and we made it through, but it was a long time to get there because, you know, you need to show the numbers, achieve the numbers, and get a lot of confidence that the real will, will happen before you cut over. We succeeded in doing that, and from there we expanded to the much easier systems. Right? But with hindsight, we could have started either backwards or concurrently. Don't take the biggest bully on the playground and go punch him in the nose and take on the fight. And when you win that, let's, let's deal with other people. Just let's play with everybody else first. Let's get a coalition going. Let's go talk to the bully all together. Right? Um, we could have taken the things that took us a day or two to show extreme value in that are not as critical, that could be converted easily with high confidence or without that much confidence just to show that we have confidence, develop confidence there, develop good practices there, get a lot of value. There are places where what we did is remove a 500 millisecond blip instead of 4 millisecond blip, and with that take out potentially a lot of engineering that wasn't yet done, so a lot of value to be saved, as opposed to here where, you know, it's less value. And then after we did those, go after that critical thing. So ending in the exact same total deployment picture, we could probably have gotten there faster by starting from the easier first things, or at least working concurrently, not serially through them. Um, so we probably would have se seen quicker ROI quicker time to gain, and, and quicker confidence in the delivery of what we do. Obviously, the choice to go with us was done based on what everybody believed we could do, but showing that that actually happens, getting to a point where two years later, they just know it's right. There's no point in doing the other, and, and if you're latency sensitive, Getting there takes time, it takes actual showing real production, stability, quality, and actual delivery. Okay, so we could have gone in a different order. Other lessons learned, GC is not the only problem. GC is just the biggest blip that makes you think, but you take that out, there are other things there. For example, um, you do have dominated outliers so it's natural to think everything is there or to pay most attention to it. But once it's gone, other problems surface. So some of the harder things, page cache lock contention. Certain Linux kernels have extremely bad locking behavior around emptying page caches. So when systems journal, where a lot of low-latency systems have to journal because they're dealing with money, um, 
then when the kernel stalls to write a whole bunch of stuff, it often actually locks and stops progress in other systems' parts. And even the lower, uh, the, the, the things that are then outside of a latency critical path going to disk might stall other things that are latency critical. Uh, power management tuning, BIOS and OS, lots of tuning things were very important. Our map file access and page faults and save points and the interaction between them, which are not unique to, you know, they, appar they apparently happen on all runtimes. Zing and non-Zing could come in and create some interesting issues. Um, now, one of the big lessons learned was to proactively, not reactively, but proactively override Linux defaults. Linux has a whole bunch of things that are just bad defaults if you care about latency behavior. They're there to save power in a data center, not to make your application behave well. And if you care about your application behavior more than you care about the power in the data center, they're the wrong choice. Um, so, you know, examples. Let's go to specifics. Um, this goes this way, because it's my set. Yeah. Um, the page cache tends to be dramatically misconfigured by default on, on uh, Linux. And this specific parameter is the distance from filling all the memory before the page cache starts flushing things out. How much empty memory is it aiming to keep in the system for things like, I don't know, allocating memory with malloc's, right? Now, interestingly, the choice of the number for that was chosen about 20 years ago, I think around two, 1995 or 96. And it was modeled according to the size of servers back then, 20 years ago. And now they didn't fix it at a constant. They had a model for it growing. But it doesn't grow linearly. It grows to the square root of the system size. So we have 20 years of accumulated system size, which roughly translates to, if 20 years around Moore's law is probably another 5 to 10,000 x capacity. But instead of growing the buffer from the edge of memory by 5,000x over time, it was the square root of 5,000x, which is a much smaller number. And what that in practice means is that the file system runs into the edge of memory all the time, creating situations where you have no empty memory and it has to get rid of stuff, but it takes time to get rid of stuff. Therefore, you have a blip on a simple memory allocation or an expansion. Uh, transparent huge pages, a really, really, really cool feature for efficiency that is really, really, really bad for any latency measurement. This thing should be turned off. It is turned on by default. Without expanding on it here, um, the simple behavior you could experience if this feature is on is that your thread, because it's doing some malloc or expanding a stack or something else, might be the one that stalls to defragment all memory in the system for the next second. And which thread gets hit with that is just Russian roulette. The more I.O. you do in your system, the more fragmented large pages are into small pages, the more likely this is to happen. Unfortunately, there's a lot of journaling I.O. happening in most of these systems, so it's very, you see it a lot. Uh, swappiness needs to be set to zero. For some reason, it's not. Um, I don't know why people with a 100 gigabyte system need the 2 gigabyte swap file, except for to make the latency bad. I don't know what it's good for other than that. But, you know, should be off and off. And then uh, this is an interesting one, zone green claim mode. Um, it turns out that by default, at least in some kernels, uh, when you have multi-node systems, like a two-socket system is a multi-node system, um, you could be turning, s um, you, you could have swap off uh, uh, on uh, swap set off, but if you end up in a case where one of the nodes is out of memory but the other one has memory, it will still swap. So unless you turn this zone reclaim on to zero, you, your swappiness could still not take effect. And there are other uh, around the page cache and the cheap sheet as well. So each and every one of these, if you don't set it right, can and will cause multi-hundred millisecond blips in your Linux system without Java being involved. So if you don't take them out proactively you know, and wait until they happen, you're just going to have a big mess to try and figure out. Because it's really hard to prove that it's one of those. When they happen, it's really hard to point a finger to them. Each one of them has been built through experience of accidentally running into a proof that one of these did something. Um, so take the lessons learned from a big industry that you know, has run and tuned things. And there are other sets, but these are good examples to start with. Okay.
some more lessons learned. Measure, measure everything. Measure everywhere you can. Um, you know, we, you know, at LMAX, measurement was already been done to a lot of things, uh, but measurement of things like jitter and hiccups and inconsistencies is a hard thing because of well, you tend to summarize data. So you have good averages, good maxes maybe, but when and how much and what the spread is is hard. So it's really hard to collect this and it's worth spending the effort to put an infrastructure to collect it. Not just within parts, but across multiple hops. You saw the kind of hops that are critical path for this. Measuring it, not just at every point, but across them with consistent time is important. Um, the other one is if you want detailed latency distribution measurements, that means you can't sample and you can't average and you have to keep, either keep a lot of information or record it in a way that supports doing that. Um, and if you have information about the latency outliers at every step and across the whole, that really helps you triage where to look. So if you have a blip on the end-to-end -end latency, but you don't have a record of where other, where, what the spread is on latency on different nodes, you don't know where to start looking within them. The averages are good everywhere. It's a blip. So you need to know which ones had blips and look for correlations. If you don't record enough information for tracking blips, it's there. Full percentile spectrum histograms are very useful for this. I've actually built an open source library that's very useful for that called HDR histogram. Mike Barker from LMAX created the C port of the same library. So it's now in Java and C. There's a C sharp port, a Python port, um, a Go port, an Erlang port. I'm waiting for the JavaScript port. You want to do a Ruby one? <laughs> well, you can just use the Java one from JRuby, so you don't care. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's become a very popular library for doing exactly that. If you're interested in measurement, I recommend you do that. And I'm also doing a full day workshop on it on Thursday if you're really interested. And not on HDR Instagram, but latency measurement and coordination is general. Um, recording system level hiccups at all levels is extremely useful for triaging. Uh, there's a tool, again, I, I actually created it three years ago in open source, it's called jhiccup. And all it does is basically measures whether your process experienced the hiccup, meaning it was supposed to be able to execute and couldn't. It measures every millisecond, so anything bigger than a millisecond of blip, for whatever reason, can't hide from it. You run one of those in your JVM to see if your JVM is blipping. You run one of those idle in another process to see if the system is blipping. And you keep records forever for that, well, for weeks. Not because you need to know all the time, but because somebody calls you up and says there was a bad transaction with a blip, and you try and figure out where the blip happened, and whether it was a system blip, a JVM blip, an application code blip. If you find that your system blip for the same magnitude as the complaint, you don't need to look at application code. There's nothing wrong with the application code. Something in the OS or in the hardware, something blipped. If you find that the system was fine, but the JVM blipped, well, then you know the system's fine and go look at the JVM itself. Maybe the tuning is wrong, maybe you're just not using Zinc. Um, then if both of these are nice and quiet and you have a blip, then some things, go look in your code. Maybe you have a queue, maybe you have some other thing that happened, maybe the latency on the wire is wrong, maybe you have bad wires. But the triage ability of that slicing, which parts of the system to go hunt down, are critical for evolving good latency over time. Now, if you look at observation points that LMAX has used. Um, yep, I'll wrap up in two minutes. Uh, observation points you can see across here. Um, there are multiple points that latency numbers or time stamping numbers are collected. And the interesting thing is the more points you add, the more it becomes interesting to think of how you collect the data and where you put it. So you take the message and you track it through and you want to know when and where things happen. And if it's a handful of things, then okay, you can often add it to the payload that a lot of people will do that. So that's a good starting point. But if you actually go through and start wanting to have many, many data points of where things were at what time for a message, it starts being a challenge to put that data in the message as it goes through. There might not be room for 50 data points in the payload or you're starting to affect the system. Now at that point, it becomes nicer and better and probably much more scalable to start logging the latency points as metadata on a side stream. So the messages are going through and you don't carry the when I was where on the actual payload, you just log to the side, message ID this was here at this time. And that's a stream of metadata going to the side, not latency critical, you just need to get it somewhere, either a journal or another system. And later you go and correlate them all. 
that becomes a post-processing streaming thing. Um, again, the purpose of this is for knowing what when you need to know, you can look at it, or you can do samples and monitoring with it too. Um, but it's a very, very useful thing, and it's worthwhile investing in that, investing a lot, I think. Because uh, if you don't do that, you're going to invest a lot in debugging in the dark. Um, so let's look at summary and wrap up. Java is viable and profitable in low latency. These are often things that people challenge. It is viable. People do it anyway, and it's profitable to do it. You can show numbers of why economically this is a good choice. From a development effort, from a cost perspective, from a profitability, a time to performance, time to profit kind of thing. Um, with regular JVMs, you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get there, but it's still profitable and viable. People do this all over the world. And Zing basically helps in that world to make it even more profitable and even more viable. Right? Um, so it's easier to do it, and it's as easy in low latency as, as in other languages. Um, so think of it as it's the speed of Java, which is similar to the speed of other languages, now with the consistency of other languages, too. Um, now, once you stop dealing with JVM related issue, you can actually go and take your smartest people and apply them to the interesting and good stuff. Think to that opening slide where Mark showed what he used to do on a regular basis. People would come to him with GC logs and try to, f to figure out together what to do about them. He doesn't do that anymore. He hasn't done this in a long time. The answer to a bad GC log is why are you not running in Zing? And we don't get bad GC logs from Zing, or we haven't seen them at least. Uh, so th that's, that's a simple summary with that. So with that, I, you know, w do we have a little time for Q&A? Or we have to go? OK. Well, um, well, yeah, we started five minutes late, so I think we're even. But if you guys want to, I mean, I think we're last here and we can go out. But if you guys want to ask me or me uh, a question, I'd be happy to answer. <laughs>